नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Live from Govardhan Echo Village in Maharashtra, India. This is episode three, officially of Wisdom of the Sages, your daily yoga podcast. I am your host Raghunath, with my co-host Kostuba, and Hello. we are here with about sixty students for our teacher training, and we are studying the sacred, if not the most sacred, yogic literature, the Srimad Bhagavatam. This is one of the epics of ancient India, maybe the top three most famous of all of ancient India. I'd say the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, and the Srimad Bhagavatam. And this is our daily, um, I, you know, daily. I feel like I, we started this. I did it at first just myself, because I think it's important on a regular basis to hear sacred literature, wisdom, and truth. And then second, I did it for the yoga students uh, that we meet on a regular basis when we travel and teach. And then, um, is there a thirdly in there too? Uh, thirdly, and anyone then, who else is? I guess the, the podcast audience out there now. Right? Yeah, the podcast audience out there now. And so this is our, it, it's, um, there's accountability with it. We've been actually doing it for a year, but it's become a podcast officially three days ago. And we've been doing it with an online group for um, just under a year. And I will say, there's a lot of days that I don't want to wake up at 5 a.m. and do this. But I know there's going to be like 70 people waiting for me online. Come on, where are you? And it's gotten me out of bed. It's forced me to read something that's good for me. And it's good to have that positive peer pressure in your life. So I'm grateful for it. And um, I know that the degree that I can hear truth on a regular basis, it helps me with my decision-making, my choices, uh, my own personal accountability for my habits. And I'm grateful we're going live with this. And I'm grateful that all these, uh, we have a double live today. We have live with our Zoom group. And then we have a whole group of 60 people. Say something, people out there. <laughs> all right, so that's our group. You can't see them if you're listening on Apple no, Podcast. But if you're listen, watching on YouTube, oh. you can see all these people. <clears throat> that's called Live Live. And then we have the uh, Live Live. And then we have, of course, the Zoom people, which are live. Zoom people, if you want to leave a message, you can write to Mara, our assistant. She's quite clever. Um, her email for, for many reasons. For many reasons. One being <laughs> for many unstated my reasons. Private school. <laughs> um, and look where that private school education's got you. You know, <laughs> you're the executive producer here on this show. Mara, if they want to write you, what's your email address? Wisdom of the Sages 108 at Gmail. I think we're going to start doing where we're taking some questions and fielding. Uh, some bigger questions. Zoom people can write oh, in. So you're live. saying people could write in questions and we could take those questions like on the next podcast. Is that yeah. what you're suggesting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Okay. And we get a little question time because sometimes some questions, great. we can also filter through them and say, I'm not answering this one. <laughs> you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you like the power. <laughs> no, I want to answer. Part, that, I mean, that's part of the, here's the deal. This is an ancient conversation. <laughs> We're about to get into the actual story. It's an actually ancient conversation between a very saintly king. Generally in the West, we hear about kings, especially in America, we hate the idea of a king. But there were ideas of kings are like leaders and leaders can, you have good, good leaders, right? You can have crazy leaders. So there was an idea of this Dharmic king and he got cursed to die and he had to find a guru and ask him, I'm about to die, what am I gonna do? I've got seven days to live. What is the duty of a man about to die? Very relevant question for us. We could die at any minute. What are we supposed to be doing with our life? And so the, the, that's the underlying theme of this entire book. And we're about to like dive right into it right now. Uh, uh, I don't know. I was on a roll there somewhere. I sort of lost. That, lost that means it's, we should start then. Yes, we should start. Chant, chant the mantras. Yes. It, it, there's some, I will say there's something special about just doing this in India as well. Yeah, it's wonderful. Oh, this is what I was going to say. It's a conversation between the king and the guru. Yeah. And then he tells the story. Well, you know, that's a good question because that story was told previously by this person. And it goes a story within a story. 
Well, that's where we're going to start today because it's going to be months before we get to that king. To that, right. It's a story within a story talking about the original story, talking about another story that's going on. And it, ha- <laughs> it goes it's a story five levels st- sometimes. Yeah, five levels deep of stories. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, this is where I was going with this. When you write in a question, this is a continuation of the story. Okay. Yeah, get it? Okay. We're living this thing right now. <laughs> This is the story. It's going on. It becomes, it's, it's real time. Well, yeah. It's real time Bhagavatam. The title of the chapter that we're reading, which is the first chapter of the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, is questions by the sages. Right. So it's all based on questioning. And, and they're going to ask questions to one sage, and that's going to come out today. And then that sage is going to say, well, I can tell you about a, a previous gathering that I was at where this king was asking very good questions of another sage. And then it goes, and then that conversation, he'll say, I can tell you about another time where there is another questions and answers going on. So it's all based on questions and answers, questions and answers, questions and answers. But the Bhagavatam is asking the most essential questions and giving the most deeply realized answers. And what you're saying is such a nice point is that we continue to take part in that same conversation by asking questions and turning to the Bhagavatam and those sages in those pages the answers you know it's this this idea of when did yoga start who began yoga what's the origin of yoga and some people say well 500 years ago or a thousand years ago when the yoga sutras came out or when the vedas were written down but here we have the oldest canon of literature in the world speaking about yoga and according to these books themselves yoga is eternal because since, since ever there was jivas or spirit souls, there's always been a certain demographic of spirit souls who felt, what the hell am I doing here? There's been, not, and not everybody. Most people just plow along with life. But there's always been a handful that have been like, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? Where am I going with this? What's the big picture here? There has been inquisitive souls. That desire to want to reconnect with source, that's yoga. And that's an eternal practice. And these conversations, the questions you might write in or email Mara, these are the questions that have been always asked. It's not just you, this is the king asking the question and it never ends and it never began. What do you think about that? That's when yoga started. It didn't. Huh? It didn't start. You're That's saying. when it didn't start. It didn't start because it's eternal. We can't even think of things. How could something yeah. be eternal? We like to think everything has a beginning. Yeah. It's different. It's a different. Got to <clears throat> expand the mind a bit. Yeah, we got to expand my little peanut brain. So we always start with this uh, invocation. We called them yesterday prayers, where we start to thank our teachers. We start to thank. Um, uh, the people who have uh, given us a taste for this stuff. We thank the book itself. We thank the author itself. So maybe we can share them on Facebook so the people that are tuning in regularly to check them out. There. Let's share them on Facebook. Where's our executive producer, Tom Essig? Not, not, not at this moment. Oh, not at this moment. But, uh, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Forget it, Tom. Scratch that. Tom. <laughs> Tom's like, oh, Tom's computer. Up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the prayer. Where's the prayer? Narayanam namaskrityam naram chayva narotamam devim sarsvatim vyasam tato jayam mudirayet. Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the very means of conquest, one should offer respectful obeisances to the personality of Godhead Narayan. That's a name for Lord Vishnu. Unto Nara Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being. By the way, that is a deity in the Himalayas where Vyasadeva lived. And you can still go to Vyasadeva's cave today where he, he compiled the Vedas. Um, Nara, Nara Narayan Rishi. Unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning. And unto Srila Vyasadeva, the author. Nasta Prayesha Bhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtaki. By regular attendance in classes on the Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed. And loving service to the personality of Godhead, 
whose praise with transcendental songs is established as an irrevocable fact. I love that. We just got a text message, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, again? Oh, let me say a prayer to our teachers. Om Agyana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshuru Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Sounds beautiful when everyone says it. Yeah. it? Um, we are on text four, but I just wanted to ask Kostuba to tease out text two because there's this really, text two is such a cool verse. Um, neglect Mukunda is my password. I just, no. I just told everybody <laughs> for your bank account for your <laughs> <laughs> honey change all you. <laughs> <laughs> people are hacking your website people <laughs> oh Krishna <laughs> this is such an interesting verse and we just blow by it, it, want to hear can I can I just do the sans the Sanskrit's so pretty Dharma projita kaita vocha paramo nirmat saranam satam vidyam vatsavam apravastu shivanam tapatrayan mulanam shimad bhagavate mahamuni kritikim. I blew that one. Kim vive para ishvaraha sadyo vidyan varudya tetra kriti bi sususvi tat shanat. It's pretty good. Not bad at all. Not bad. Not bad. But check out this verse. Cause actually, why don't you do this? Why don't you do this one? Because this is a good one. I love, love to hear your the translation. Um, I got yeah, it right get, here. You got it. Okay. The translation of the verse. Yeah, tra translation of the verse, and then just to tease it out a little. Okay. This concept of kaitava dharma. It, it's translated to be cheating dharma, cheating or yeah. cheating religion. By the way, uh, the Prabhupada, the uh, translator, sometimes takes this word dharma and replaces it with religion. I change it back to dharma because yeah. I think religion has a weird concept, but what it really means is sort of to do your spiritual duties of this world. But in the yoga community, we all know this word dharma. So I just, I take the translation and retranslate it back to Sanskrit. Mm. So cheating dharma, completely rejecting all spiritual practices that have cheating dharma. Can you explain that, Kaita the dharma? Sure. It, you know, the entire, what the Bhagavatam is doing is it's saying, it, again, we have to understand it in the context. There's a context here that we're going to hear about in the fifth chapter where it describes how um, the author, Srila Vyasadeva, after having compiled a very wide range of literature that was meant for the upliftment of society through yoga, um, he's feeling dissatisfied. Internally, something is not quite right. And he's lived this very pure life, and he's this very sensitive, refined person. And he's trying to get to the heart of it. Why am I not feeling quite right? It, it, I feel like I've tried to do everything right. I've tried to live right. Why am I feeling some sense of dissatisfaction? And then his guru, Narda, who becomes an important player in the entire Bhagavad Gita. Ramayam, Mahabharata, uh, all these yeah. stories. Beautiful, beautiful character. We told a story about Narda this morning in class. Oh. What story? Oh, he met King, in Krishna's leader, he met King Kamsa. In the story of uh, the birth of Lord Krishna. Mm. So, so he reveals to Vyasadeva, you've given this broad range of literature, but people are confused by it because you're speaking on different levels at different times. Sometimes you're writing for people whose motive isn't entirely pure. People that are approaching, say, religion or dharma because they want the things of this world, because they want to try to find enjoyment and happiness through material things. And so there is such a thing of you can be like a pious materialist and get certain good karma, good blessings in your life, and you can try to enjoy that. Now, that's not the highest stage. And if some, someone might focus on that part of Vyasadeva's literature, which you could, you could say is the four Vedas, mm. and they may think, well, this is what life is all about. Um, and then you've given other literature that says that that's actually not what life's all about. There's more to it than that. That's just a first step. But there's a higher step where you can renounce the things of this world and try to find deep, deep, sense of internal peace um, based on truth, based on the fact that I'm not my body, that happiness doesn't come from external things. Happiness comes from the nature of the soul. It has to be uncovered. And that's a higher, and, and through that, I want to find peace. Mm. But, but, and, and many people think that's the highest stage of all spirituality. It sounds pretty good, peace. But there's something more than peace. <laughs> because just like, say you were out on a beach and you got away from your, the, that, 
you know, you, you, you escape to, to the Bahamas for a vacation, you're out there, you got away from all the hectic stuff in your work life and so on, and you found some peace. But if you're all alone, after a while, you're going to feel some sense of disconnection, you know, because I know, I know exactly. Yeah. I need like a, I need to talk to people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but what, what the Bhagavatam is going to say is through that earlier literature, you might've thought that the nature of the soul, if, if, if happiness is found within, then if I reach the nature of the soul, if I go deep within, I'll find happiness. But, but what the Bhagavatam is going to take one step further and say that the very nature of the soul is to love. That's why we're all searching for it in this world, left and right. And oh, even if we find, ha even if we get the material things, we still feel incomplete. Even if we find a certain level of peace at a certain point, we begin to feel incomplete because by nature we love or we serve. And that requires connection. Now the Bhagavatam is gonna say that the highest motive is not the motive to enjoy the things of this world. It's not the motive of even to escape the sufferings of this world and find peace. The highest motive is to connect with our divine source through love and through that to connect with every living being, every human, every plant, every animal that we actually feel a deep sense of connection with and a deep sense of love for. And that's the highest stage of yoga. That's where, that's where it all goes. Can, can, I, can I share a real uh, pedestrian um, uh, analogy I've been working on? Please tell do. me what you think about this. Okay. Okay. You got uh, materialism. Materialism means... I think everything's, you know, mine. I got what I got. I, I don't recognize a higher source. Picture a kid with his parents and he just steals the car. It's like materialism. I just take whatever I want. There's no authority. I do whatever I want. Not recognizing who's Not the owner. Not recognizing who's the owner of the car. Completely disrespect. I just see a car, I take it. I'm going, going for a ride. And of course, there's punishment that goes with that. There's natural consequences from taking and not appreciating that this, this is somebody's. Let me guess. That would be karma in your pedestrian. No, that's, no, that's pure materialism. That's no, but I'm saying the, the punishment. The punishment is some type of natural reaction, yeah. yeah. So in the next phase is, you know what? Somebody owns this car. My mom owns this car. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, mom, thanks for dinner. I'm going to clean the kitchen today. Why? Because I love you. Why are you going to clean the kitchen? <laughs> well, actually, I, I do love you, but I was wondering if I could use the car tonight because I want to go out with my friends. So the mother, being kind, says, okay, you clean up this whole kitchen, then you can take the car. That's karma yoga. That's, yeah. That's karma yoga. I'm that doing some work. That was V-karma before. It, yeah, it was V-karma. V-karma means a completely inappropriate action. Now, in karma yoga, that means I recognize there is... Or karma kanda, even. But sometimes they mix those terms, right? Like... I'm keeping it real simple. Okay. <laughs> I'm keeping it. <laughs> because karma yoga can also be that I'm act, acting without any, but that you could they call sakama karma yoga. Okay, but I'm let's not get it too. Simple. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a real simple man, <laughs> sir. Because <laughs> she was like, that's sakama karma. <laughs> <laughs> that's sakama karma yoga, not nishkama karma yoga. <laughs> <laughs> you got to see who you're dealing with here. Um, so anyway, so... Yeah, I'm recognized there's a higher authority and I'm going to work and do some work in this world to appease the high authority, <laughs> but I'm doing it because I actually want a return on my investment. Okay. That's karma yoga. And it's, it's yoga, meaning it's connecting through the divine because I'm accepting that there is a divine, right? I'm accepting that there is a higher authority. Now, bhakti yoga is different. Bhakti yoga means, mom, uh, I want to clean the kitchen. Why? What do you want? Nothing. I just appreciate you made dinner. You cook this dinner, and I want to clean the kitchen because I appreciate you. Come on, what do you want? Seriously. Actually, I, just, I, I want to make you happy because I, like, I feel happy when I, you're happy. Yeah, I feel so, I'm so blessed. And then what happens is the mother becomes more grateful, and you end up getting more anyway because when you, right? If you have a kid, come on, moms or dads. If you have a kid that is so grateful, you just naturally want to give him whatever you want. You want to take the car whenever you want to take the car. I trust you. That's just the nature. And that's why, interesting point here, we talk about cities, my mystical powers. They say that the liberated bhakti yogi has all mystic powers. Why? Because they're not trying for them. They're just gifted because there's a reciprocal relationship with Bhagawan. Bhagawan wants to constantly please the liberated soul. So they say, that's why there's this whole thing in India, get the blessings of guru. 
Why? Because the good, it, it's through the blessings that you get the blessings of Bhagavan. What do you think about that? That's my new analogy. I like it. Okay. So anyway, that okay. was the Kaita Bodharma. So we're going to dive back into the verses now. And we're on text uh, four. Once in a holy place, in the forest of Namasarenya, place still exists, by the way. All these places you read, Mahabharat, Ramaya, they're all here. They're all here. You go to them. Mah uh, Bhagavad Gita, go to Kurukshetra. You can go to it. It's all there. All these places built, it's still there. Once in a holy place in the forest of Namasharanya, great sages, headed by the sage Shanaka, assembled to perform a great thousand-year sacrifice for the satisfaction of the Lord and his devotees. You know, when I first time I ever read this, matter of fact, maybe thousands of times I've read this verse, I always thought the sacrifice took a thousand years. But it happened every thousand years. Mm -hmm. All right, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so, by the way, this may sound crazy. Mm -hmm. How often do they have Kumbh Mail every 12 years? Four years. Maha well, the Maha Kumbh is yeah. every 12 years. If you're unfamiliar with Kumbh Mela, it's the massive, biggest spiritual festival in the, in the world. How many million people go, Tara? 12, 12 million. 12 million? <laughs> 12 million? Just throw in the pull, pull that down. <laughs> 12? <laughs> Is that the hot seat? 12. Oh, yeah. Well, I did a census, Tara. That was like 15 million people. It's a ridiculous amount of people. Yogis come from the Himalayas. People come from all over to this festival. It happens every 12 years, and it happens like clockwork. Then there's festivals that happen every four years. They, they, they happen, uh, Tom, Tom, what are you doing? Tom? <laughs> Is, were you talking a sign language? He's indicating like, something about the sound. Something indicating. What's that? Oh, don't touch the don't microphone. Touch the don't microphone. touch the microphone. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> it's just like, I was like, was like milk, the milk the cow. Milk the cow. First word. Second word. <laughs> Sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we roll. This is the vlog with Tom class we're dealing with here. <laughs> so anyway, there are, there are like these fest, and some, you know what's weird about Indians? Okay, you, we got some Indians out there. Didi, right? You can vouch for this. Indians have like Vedic calendars like woven into their brains. They have like, okay, it's a full moon. Okay, it's the third day of the moon. Okay, it's the fourth day of the moon. It's three days before the full moon. It's Makar Sankranti. It's Makar Sankranti. They have thousands <laughs> of holidays. Matter of fact, when we first came to India, there's like so many holidays. I was like, how do you guys even work? <laughs> every day's a festival. Every, you try to fa you can't fast. Every day's a feast day, a fast day. It's unbelievable. There's so many festivals. Even, even if you live in an ashram in America, you're never following all the festivals they have in India, right? Yeah, true. It's unbelievable. And then there's yearly festivals. This happens every, right? There's a special leap month, the holy leap month, where it's like all of Delhi takes off for a month. <laughs> what? <laughs> right? Pur Shotamas, it's leap month. Everybody goes to Vrindavan on that month. Then there's like these, these Maha Kumbh Melas, what do you think that is? You think it's like a Christmas party? That's one month, 15 million people go to, the, uh, to Prayagraj, just one city in India, where these three sacred rivers meet, and they just set up camp. 15 million people set up, and somehow impeccably organized. It's hard to believe that, but it is. Then they have festivals. My friend went to a festival that happens every 100 years. Can you even imagine that? Every 100 years, meaning you might miss it in your lifetime. There was one. And they all know it, and they're waiting for it. It's coming. <laughs> and this one they're talking about a thousand year one it happens every thousand years and these vedic astrologers know it's so because you know what they're seeing time on a much bigger thing than we are mm. isn't that interesting it is interesting <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys zoomers <laughs> think about <laughs> that <laughs> These Zoomers are dedicated people, I will say. They're here every day doing this. I'm quite impressed. Uh, once, okay, so they're, they're here for this thousand year sacrifice. By the way, when we say this word, and you hear this word a lot, a sacrifice, generally you think we're like, you know, killing a lamb or a goat or something. It's not what they mean by a sacrifice. Sacrifice just means like some type of religious ritual. ritual. Yeah. Some type of ritual is going on uh, dedicated to Lord Vishnu. Um, Okay, text five. One day, after finishing their morning duties, 
by burning a sacrificial fire and offering a seat of esteem to Srila Sutta Goswami, the great sages made inquiries with great respect about the following matters. So there's Sutta Goswami, he's seated on the high seat. He's the respected sage. And then there's all these other liberated souls. Now, this is an interesting point. These questions are asked by liberated <laughs> souls. You're not going to get basic questions. You're not going to be get, um, is it okay to murder people? You're going to get very, ev just like math. If I'm going to teach math to a little, you know, my little five-year-old, I'm going to be like, three apples and three apples equals how many apples? Six apples, right? I'm not going to go to a, uh, a calculus two class and go, three apples and three apples, right? You can give these guys, you can ask them much more sophisticated mathematical questions. The questions in the Bhagavatam are very evolved. Why? Because the speakers and the, 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 the teachers and the students are all already liberated. So the questions are very lofty and very high and very deep. Uh, blah, blah, blah. They started asking questions about the following matters. The sages said, Respectful, respected Sutta Goswami, you are completely free from all vice. Now, what, that is one of the qualifications. That's to, why they're approaching him. Right. He's free from all vice. Um, you are well versed in all the scriptures. You're famous for Dharmic life and in the Puranas and in the histories as well. For you have gone through them under the proper guidance and have also explained them. I mean, so much there. But this is, this, beyond telling the history of what's been going on, it's, it's indicating how we are meant to understand spiritual knowledge. That you find someone who's living it, who's free of vice, who's, who's studied it under the right kind of teachers, and then able to hand that down rather than just I pick up the book and I make up my own interpretation of it. Make my own interpretation or, my, or, or, the person that's, or the person that's teaching me, they themselves are under control of Rajas and Thomas. You know, we yeah. talk about these three gunas <laughs> and the yoga system has this encouragement. Everything that we're doing is to, to bring us to this sattva gun, right? Rajas and Thomas. Uh, should we even explain this now or... I think if we explain too many things at once, we never get the flow of the story. All right, let's get the flow of the there'll story. Be, there'll let's be many flow. podcasts. People are there. nodding, going, flow, flow it. Okay, flow. <laughs> flow, you pushy people. <laughs> you pushy, pushy audience. <laughs> now I want to flow too. Please, therefore, being blessed with many years, explain to us in an easily understandable Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did I miss something? Text seven. <laughs> Sorry about that. You're flowing too much now. I, I, was, I, I <laughs> flowed right over there. <laughs> okay, let's get the page. Being the eldest learned Vedantist, O Sutta Goswami, you are acquainted with the knowledge of Vyasadeva, who is the incarnation of Godhead. And you know other sages who are fully versed in all kinds of physical and metaphysical knowledge. Mm. And because you are submissive, your spiritual masters have endowed you with all the favors bestowed upon a gentle disciple. Therefore, you can tell us all that you have scientifically learned from them. It also explains how the student should be. Beautiful verse. Yeah, the student can inquire. It's normal to inquire. It's different if people are always challenging you yet, challenging you. Yeah, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's bull. That's crazy. That's nuts. That's not how you inquire. You inquire, what do you think about this? I don't understand this. Yeah, you, you might not get it at all. I don't understand Ganesh. I don't understand mysticism. I don't understand. Can you please explain it to me? That's a different way than just being challenging with everything. If you challenge the teacher, the teacher's just going to clam up. We approach with a type of humility and a type of sincerity. Yeah, this, this kind of knowledge, it's not like regular I'm academic like knowledge. Asleep. Yeah. Sorry. It, it's, not the, it's not just like you can read it out of a book or study it like in an academic way. In a, you may study it in an academic way. You may memorize it. You may be able to um, quote it at great length. But the idea is that transcendental knowledge actually the deeper understanding of who I am, of what this world is, is what divinity is and how it's all connected. 
that's something that's revealed to someone with the right attitude. You know, and so here it says, you are a gentle disciple of your gurus. You know, and I think that word gentle, it implies a lot, you know. Uh, <laughs> Where, I tell this story that, you know, uh, we don't have that word gentle. Like if a guy is gentle in America, if we say, hey, man, I met your son. He's really gentle. You'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. What's the problem with him? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a put down to call a guy gentle. But it's like, it, the idea is that it's actually a quality that a person could be gentle. I met somebody once and he said, uh, uh, I want you to meet uh, our eldest student here. He is a great, he helps all the other children when they come. He's a senior at our high school. He is uh, very learned. He got all, passed all his uh, grades, top of his class. He is, um, uh, knows uh, three different languages. And above all, he is very, very gentle. Mm. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I help him with something? <laughs> It's not like a yeah. compliment in America to call somebody gentle, but it's actually a very beautiful thing. I think it's implying <clears throat> that you're sensitive to others mm. and, 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 and so you're not selfish, that, that you're not so wrapped up in, I need this to be happy and I need that to be happy and I need to move everything so that I can find my satisfaction. It means I'm happy within and now I'm concerned about others. And it's saying because you were like that and you served your gurus like that, they felt so such compassion and, and, and such love for you that this, that this flow of spiritual knowledge from one being to another, just it flew uninterru uninterrupted. And so they're saying, these sages are saying, amongst all these sages, you really live that life and you've really learned all these teachings and really understand it deeply because of who you are and who you've connected with and who you've received the blessings from. So we're asking you these questions. You are gentle. Thank you too. Well, that's why I hang out at gentlemen's clubs. <laughs> I don't know if that's the same kind of. <laughs> you know what a gentleman's in America? A gentleman's club is like a, it's like the darkest of all places a man can go. But for some reason, it's called the gentleman's club. The last thing you're going to find there is a guy with a monocle and a top hat. <laughs> is it Mr. Peanut? <laughs> <laughs> nine please therefore being blessed with many years explain to us in an easily understand well, i just read that what you have ascertained to be the absolute and ultimate good for the oh that's a good one maybe i didn't read this you didn't read this what you have ascertained to be the absolute and ultimate good for people in general this yeah. is even beyond spirituality what's the ultimate good for me this the context of this question is that again, they, they just said, you understand the works of Yasity, the great sage that compiled all of the literature that all of Eastern philosophies either directly derived from or largely influenced by. They're saying, and it's so vast that people have a hard time interpreting what's most important in it. But because you were such a good disciple and because you've been blessed and because you're learned, we're asking you to, to explain to us, taking from that literature, what's the What's the best thing for people? Is it the idea that if I live piously and enjoy the material things in this world, is that the best thing? Or is it to escape the sufferings of this world and find peace through renunciation? Or is it bhakti? Is it divine love that, that ultimately delivers the highest benefit for all mankind? You understand this literature. Please explain that. And it, but this was Vyasadeva's mission to explain it in Bhagavatam. And as like, like a playwright, he's chosen this meeting to begin the book so that he can write from the beginning, get right to the heart of the question. You know, what, what is most important in yoga? What is the most important in life? How do we find the highest good for all mankind? Man, this purple port is so like, it's just got, can I dip in a little Please, bit? Please, yeah. Okay. So Srila Prabhupada's- Yeah, there's no ways, for, his, for thousands of years, this book has been commented on. And so uh, the last commentary we have is one by uh, Srila Prabhupada. And by the person who in a similar way showed that he had the ability to understand and communicate to others by bringing bhakti to, to the Western world. Um, he says, in, in Kali Yuga, that's the age that we live in right now, happened, started about 5,000 years ago. It's considered the dark time, the dark time. We're in a little bit of a, a golden era, golden era right now. Age of Aquarius, perhaps you might call it. Uh, Although it's a little under the surface. I'm yeah. Very, hopefully it will manifest more. But, but it said in this, in this Kali Yuga, the duration of life is shortened, not so much because of insufficient food, but because of irregular habits. 
Isn't that true? Yeah. We've got a bunch of irregular habits. I do. I'm working on it, but I'm a little irregular. <laughs> like when you buy, <laughs> like when you buy a pair of jeans and it says irregular. <laughs> I was thinking you meant irregular in another way. Yeah. <laughs> Overeating, over sense gratification, over dependence on another's mercy, and artificial standards of living sap the very vitality of human energy. Therefore, the duration of life is shorted. The people of this age are also very lazy, not only materially, but in the matter of self realization. The human life is especially <laughs> meant for self realization. That is to say, mankind should come to know what he is and what the world is, and what the supreme truth is. Human life is a means by which the living entity can end all miseries of the hard struggle for life in material existence, and by which they can return to Godhead. By the way, Godhead is worth sort of defining. Didn't we have the, what is Godhead day on the show one day? What's the English translation? For, we don't use, it's like a British word, I think. Sounds like it to me. It's sort of British sounding. Old English. You, you want to bust out Wikipedia, Mara? You on that? Okay, we're going to just keep reading. Mary will come soon. His eternal, uh, okay. But due to a bad system of education, they have no desire for self-realization. Even if they come to know about it, they are unfortunately become victims of misguided teachers. Hmm. Godhead. Okay, Mary's on it. Godhead and unrelated, uh, de deity, divinity, the quality of being God, conceptions of God. Godhead in Judaism, the unknowable aspect of God, which lies beyond its actions or emanations. This didn't help me one bit. <laughs> <laughs> He's God. <laughs> it just means God, I guess. It's an exotic way of saying God. In this age, men are victims not of only different political creeds and parties, but also of many different types of sense gratific sense gratific Tory. sense gratificatory diversions. <laughs> Is that a word? Sense gratificatory. Such as cinemas, sports, gambling, clubs, mundane libraries. Gentlemen's clubs. Gentlemen's clubs. <laughs> bad association. Smoking, drinking, cheating, pilfering, bickering, and so on. Their minds are always disturbed and full of anxieties due to so many different engagements. They manufacture their own religious faiths, which are not based on any revealed scriptures. And they often, and very often, are addicted. They are addicted to sense gratification and they're attracted by such institutions. Anyway. But you didn't read the verse. No. <laughs> you read the purport to the next verse. Oh, duh. What <laughs> is wrong with me? <laughs> but that's a great- On a regular basis, anyway, I say that about myself. The purport like, could- What is wrong It could me? lead into the verse. It could lead into it. <laughs> I do. It's like dyslexia at its best. I'm reading the purport first. Okay, this is the- Okay, this is actually a famous verse. Yeah. Prayena payushaha sabya. O learned one, in this iron age of Kali, men have but short lives. They are quarrelsome, lazy, misguided, and unlucky, and above all, always disturbed. Anybody feel mm. a little disturbed? <laughs> That's one of the qualifications of being born in this age. This, this, this verse also gives further context to what's going on in this meeting of the stages. That they knew that this Iron Age of Kali was coming, was upon us. It's like they're right at the uh, intersection. The, 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 the cusp. The cusp. And, and so... Whatever you say, I just double it. <laughs> cusp. Cusp. <laughs> say something again, I'll double it. <laughs> so, I'm his echo. I'm his echo. <laughs> but I say it like dramatically. Cusp. <laughs> <laughs> well, I felt like you were grasping for that word, right? So, so, um, so they're on the cusp of the Kali Yuga, of this age, that they knew spirituality is so difficult to practice. But out of their compassion, they, they were wondering, what can we do? What can we provide for the future generations? And, and the sacrifice was meant to address this. But they felt like they weren't getting there. They felt like it's not working. We're, we, they haven't quite put their finger on it. And then they turned to Sudha Goswami and they ask him, let's, let's, let's just, let's focus. Sometimes you have like a, you're trying to get a consensus from a wide body and you're realizing we're not getting there. And then you turn to that one person that you feel like you just tell us. And so, so here they're saying this age is, is coming. People are lazy. They're misguided. They're unlucky. 
they can't make sense out of all the, the, the yogic scripture or religious scripture. And so uh, help us, help us help them. Yeah, they got issues. That was a nice way of saying they've got issues. Got People issues. nowadays have issues. There are many varieties of scripture. So even in India at this time, it's different. We were talking earlier, there's different. I was, I was going to just say before we read this verse. Go ahead. In one sense, this next verse is what the entire next, you know, 18,000 verses are going to spring from. One basic, most fundamental question about life. And, and, and the language that's used is going to come up again um, in, in further chapters. It's kind of like a ringing out that it's going back to this question. It's going back to this question. There are many varieties of scriptures and all of them oh. uh, there are many. There are many prescribed duties, which can be learned only after many years of studied in the various divisions. So if Yasudev himself took all these different types of knowledge, were passed down by teacher and teacher and student, almost like, I mean, we've seen that practically in, in, in a few generations. The father taught the son carpentry. He grows up and teaches his son carpentry. The candle maker does the same. The blacksmith baker the butcher the, the candlestick maker <laughs> <laughs> okay so we see that so so blah, blah. so so all this oral knowledge which was being passed down Vyasadev also the author understanding okay it's coming the dark season's coming the where people are going to be unlucky unfortunate lousy memories we got to write this stuff down. We have to codify this stuff. Mm. And um, he said, out of all these things, please select the essence of all these books and explain it for the good of all living beings. That by such instruction, their hearts may be fully satisfied. Yeah. So how do we find complete satisfaction of the heart? That's the question. I mean, I, there's so many yoga literature, just, even just in Vyasadeva's work. There's so many songs. There's so many, so, there's, there's so many teachers. Huh? I'm trying to think of heart songs or heart. Total Eclipse of the Heart? Is that what you're looking for? Was that it? I don't know. It's a total. That's how I was singing. <laughs> just name that tune. <laughs> but, but the point is, the sages are saying that there's so much yogic literature, there's so much religious literature. Even in Vyasadeva's works, it's so vast. Please. Right now, as we're going into this darker, darkest age, bring it right down to the essence and, 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 and get right to the point of how one finds complete, not even partial, but complete satisfaction in the self. How can we be completely delivered through yoga? And, and so Vyasadeva, he, this was his mission going into writing this book. So he's chosen this gathering of sages where this question was asked and answered to begin. By the way, I got to step back one big step because you're using this word yoga and some people will be like, wait a second, this yoga podcast. I was expecting instructions on down dog. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're using yoga in the classical sense of connecting the spirit to the divine. Yeah. That's what yoga means. The asanas are a condiment of a much bigger meal. Does that make sense? It's a yoga podcast because it's teaching the essence of yoga. The essence of yoga is connection. Right? What's the, right? It'd be awkward, right? If I, we've taken the condiment and made it the meal in the West, haven't we? Mm. If you say I'm doing yoga, what does that mean? I'm doing asana. It means I'm doing the asana practice. That's the equivalent of me saying, uh, come on over to my house. You want some condiments? Come on. Or you want, you want lunch? Yeah, I'd bring him a bowl of <laughs> sea <ketchup>. salt. Here, <laughs> here's some chutney and sea salt. Enjoy it. Now, does it mean that the chutney and the sea salt aren't very valuable? They're valuable and they're tasty. <laughs> but they're part of some a bigger meal and the meal is the changing of the consciousness yeah the changing of the vision can i share a definition of yoga yes you may Prabhu. so yoga is a practice which empowers one to overcome the obstacle of the mind for the purpose of the self experiencing its own true nature say that again Yoga is a practice. We're talking about like men have short memories. I, like, I just heard that and I can't remember it. Say it again. I'm going to listen this time. I'm really going to concentrate. Yoga is a practice which empowers one to overcome the obstacle of the mind. Okay, got that. Why? For the purpose of the self 
experiencing its own true nature. Okay. Okay. I might have to hear that three times, but that's how they go again? with that here. Okay. So, so in other words, yoga is a practice that I mean, we got to write that down on the board there. Okay. We'll do. But yoga is a practice that's meant to address the mind. Any kind of yoga in any practice in yoga, any mantra that we chant, any asana that we do, any ritual that we follow, any um, social mores that are connected to the yoga culture that we follow, there's a reason for them all. And that reason is always going to be connected to how it affects the mind. Now, what, why are we trying to deal with the mind? Because it's the mind that's standing between us experiencing our own true nature. What is the nature of the self? These scriptures are going to tell us that the true nature of the self is such it ananda, eternal, full of wisdom or knowledge and full of bliss, that that's who we are underneath. But we're not experiencing it because we're not identifying with the self, we're identifying with the mind and the body. And it's this very tricky mind that prevents us from experiencing that true nature. So yoga is a practice which is to help us get control of the mind so that it stops interfering. Now, what is asana for? We call, we use the word yoga as to refer to asana. Asana is a practice that affects the body. The body affects the mind. Right? So we practice asana so that all of the channels in the body are flowing smoothly because when our digestive system and our respiratory system and et cetera, and all of these channels in the body are flowing smooth, then the mind tends to become more lucid and clear. And then we can use that as a stage to go deeper into meditation and go within. So it has a connection to the mind and ultimately so that we can go in and connect with the true nature of the self and through doing that connect with divinity. So when I'm using the word yoga in that sense, I'm talking about that um, there's so much literature, yogic literature, there's so much literature about how to kind of, how, how to feel the complete nature of the self, how to connect with God completely. Um, it's the mind that's in the way and yoga is meant to, to address the mind. Dana, Dana asked a good question. She says, uh, Prabhu's, mm -hmm. this may be a very very Western way of thinking, but are there spiritual stages and sequential progressions one goes through? You know, it's, that's a great question because the answer is, of course there are, but then, but it, what's, it's interesting. Of course there are. And at the same time, what's happening in the Bhagavatam is that Vyasa is realizing, I laid out this whole gradual process and people got so confused by it that they think the beginning of it is the end of it. So let me just get right to the heart of it. So there's two, there's two ways to look at spirituality or practice spirituality. On one hand, always there's going to be the next step and the next step and the next step to move forward in. Just like you were describing, there's Vikarma where we, where we don't have any kind of realization. Then there's Karma Yoga where there may be a certain motive behind what we're doing. And then that comes to a higher stage where the motive is entirely pure, that it's just based on love, pure selflessness, pure love. Um, so, so there are stages, but sometimes, and what's happening in the Bhagavatam is, hey, let's focus on that final stage and practice it directly too. So there's, it's nuanced. You know, it's, there's not a simple answer to that question. Would you like to say something about it? No, I want to hear you. Okay, that's what I've got okay. to say. Um, what was the purport you want? You had a purport you wanted. Well, that that I think there's a wonderful purport to that to this verse as well. If you'd like to dip into it, atma or self is the purport. It, let, let's just say the phrase that was used there was yain atma supersidity, how one finds complete satisfaction of the soul. You can say that's the goal of yoga. You know, complete happiness. It means I've uncovered my true nature. So they use this term, ye not must supersidity. How can humanity, taking all this literature and all of these practices, what can you boil it down to its essence so that we can directly understand very clearly how does one find ye not must supersidity, complete satisfaction of the self, complete satisfaction of the soul? Ye not must supersidity. That's a great one. Um, atma or self is distinguished from matter and material elements. It is spiritual in constitution, and thus it is never satisfied by any amount of material planning. Mm. All sacred literature and spiritual instructions are meant for the satisfaction of the self or the atma. There are many varieties of approaches which are recommended for different types of living beings in different times and at different places. Consequently, the numbers of revealed scriptures are innumerable. 
There are different methods and prescribed duties recommended in various scriptures. Take into consideration the fallen condition of the people in general in this age of Kali. The sages of Namascharanya suggested that Sutta Goswami relate the essence of all of them. Because in this age, it's not possible for the fallen people to understand and undergo all the lessons of all these various scriptures. Because so, they're dented cans. Because we're dented cans. That's our little word here. I was even talking to Radha Swami. He just said, people in this age, he, he didn't call it dented, dented cans. cans. He just said, <laughs> he just said in this age, it's like people have been through so much trauma mm. that it's almost like to even explain the basic things, they're suffering so tremendously. They can't even hear any good advice because mm. they're covered by trauma and hurt and they're so angry and they can't let go of the basic anger. Mm. He said, uh, He said, you know, at times like that, you just need a good therapist to work with or you need a person who's a therapist that understands spirituality as well. Now, if, if you, uh, we say things like, you know, spiritual life is, is very simple, but if we've had a lot of uh, damage that happened to us in a lifetime. We have to work through this damage. Or else what I do is I bring all my bad habits into my spiritual circle. If I can't trust people, that doesn't work good in a spiritual circle. If, I'm, if I've been attacked or hurt or been uh, cruelly made fun of my entire life, and because of that, I'm cruel and I make fun of people and I hurt people, and then I bring that into my spiritual circle, no good. I have to let go and I have to either do it with the help of some guide or a therapist or mentor. When I come into a spiritual circle, I've got to be like on my A game because mm. there's special people and I don't want to just create havoc by me being so offensive because of my material life. I was so incredibly offensive. I know myself. It's like, if I want to like make all this stuff work, I've got to almost reinvent myself. I think that becomes really awkward if we're very new to this because sometimes it almost seems a little fanatical. You know, it's like uh, you go from being like, I'm, you know. You're thinking of people that... I was thinking of me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking of me when I first came to India in 1988. Okay. I was hanging out with a bunch of like, you know, knucklehead crazies mm. from the Lower East Side. And then all of a sudden I tried to be like a monk. I was like, oh, oh, namaste, namaste, walking around and namaste everybody. But deep inside, I was still a knucklehead. And I, and I remember, uh, Mara likes this story, so I'll tell it. But I remember, and you know, in India, everyone's got, they're, they're, they're missing the personal space in India. Like you get right into someone's face like this in India and it's no big deal. In America, someone does that to you. It's like so weird. <laughs> Let me finish my story before you blast me. I got two minutes. Okay, I got to finish the story in two minutes. So I remember, you know, being a, a new monk, trying to be in my best behavior, and I'm having a conversation outside the ashram with somebody, and some, you know, Indian guy just comes over. I'm having a conversation. He just looks at me like this. <laughs> like gets right up in my face. Like this. It is head, uncomfortable. Head tilted <laughs> sideways looking at me. And, you know, I'm trying to be, oh, namaste. I'm not going to be bothered by this. I'm not going to even look at them. I'm just going to smile and nod. But, you know, in New York City, you don't look at people. If you look at someone in New York, you're ready to kids. I say, look down. You get in the summer, you look at the floor, man. <laughs> look at the floor. And they're like, why, can, why can't we look up? Because someone will kill you or take you. Or... <laughs> so, it's, you know, if you're a New Yorker, that's just how you train. You don't look at people. But this guy's just gawking at me and it's driving me crazy. And everything in my material being is like bubbling over. And then finally, after, after this was going on for five minutes, I go, I just looked at him and I go, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> you, what's you your crack. problem? I, I snapped into like street mode. <laughs> and then he just looked at me with folded hands and namaste. He goes, I was just looking at you, Prabhu. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, why am I so dark and evil? <laughs> <laughs> and I always quote him saying, I was just looking at you, Prabhu. <laughs> anyway, that's my sad story. We're all dented cans. We're all dented cans a little bit. We're trying to undent ourselves. That looks like the end. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on the podcast. We're going to sign off now. We'll see you tomorrow. 
everyone on Zoom, thanks for being here. So, Stuba, you want to give them a tour of who's here? Thanks for everybody joining late. Fabio from Italy. We've got an international crew. Here's the Yogi Lori. Who's his iPhone? All these people. All right. Live and live, live. We've had like a. Bolo <laughs> Jerade. Bolo! From the Govardhan Echo Village. Runtaraj Sibad Bhagavatam Ake! Vrindavan Viharila Sikhist Bhagavan Ake! Arsani Wali Simati Radhika Ake! Sikhuru Deva Ake! Jena Prabhupada Ake! Gauda Prabhupada Ake! <laughs> Thanks everyone. See you tomorrow, 7:30 Eastern Time. I see. Bye, back to Louie. I see. I see. I uh, thanks everybody joining us. <laughs>